Today I've got a really nice result involving writing numbers in certain bases. And in fact, we're gonna write numbers in base Fibonacci, whatever that means. But before we do that, I'd like to recall a well-known fact. And that is every natural number n has a unique base b expression, where b is a number which is bigger than or equal to two. So for example, we can express 19 as a sum of powers of two. It's 16 plus two plus one. So that's two to the fourth plus two to the one plus two to the zero. So that's a base two expansion of 19. Furthermore, we can write 37 as 27 plus nine plus one. So that's three cubed plus three squared plus three to the zero. That is a base three expression. Now notice we've only got coefficients of one for all of these powers of three, but since we're working base three here, we could have coefficients of one or two. And that's exhibited by this next uh, example. So 28, that's the same thing as 16 plus 12, but 12 is three times four. So that's four squared plus three times four to the one. So that would be our base four expansion of 28. So notice the coefficients of powers of four here are allowed to be one, two, or three. So in general, we can write n as d0 times b to the zero, d1 times b to the one plus all the way up to dk times b to the k, where these dj's are between one and b minus one. And this expression is unique. So we won't prove this, but this is the base b expansion of the number n. Okay, so what we'll show today, which is like sometimes thought of as a base Fibonacci expansion, is also known as Zeckendorf's theorem. And so it involves kind of redefining the Fibonacci numbers just very, very slightly. We're kind of shifting them a little bit. So instead of taking the seeds to be one and one, we'll take them to be one and two. So we'll take the first Fibonacci number to be one, the second Fibonacci number to be two, and then we'll let the recursion take over. So like I said, this is just a shifting by one. So these have exactly the same numbers as the standard Fibonacci numbers. And then Zeckendorf's theorem says that every natural number n can be uniquely expressed as a sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Okay, before we dive into the proof, let's get a chart on the board of some examples of this happening. So now let's build a chart for some small numbers and their base Fibonacci expansion. So we've got n over here and we'll do the expansion over here on the right bit. So let's notice that one is the same thing as the first Fibonacci number. So that's our only expansion of one as a Fibonacci number. Then two is the second Fibonacci number, so that's F2. And then three is the third because three is equal to two plus one. So that's not super interesting. But let's notice that four is equal to F3 plus F1, that's three plus one. So we can write that as F3 plus F1. One. Now let's notice that that is a sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers and they are also non-consecutive. F2 is between each of these. So that's the condition that we have down here. Okay, so let's do five now, but let's notice that five is equal to F4 and that's because that is three plus two. So we can rewrite that as F4. And that's why we need these to be non-distinct because F3 plus F2 is F4 by the recursion right here. So five is a Fibonacci number, so we're done. And then six, well, that's obviously one more than five, so we can write that as F4 plus F1. Seven is two more than five, so that's F4 plus F2. And we're still non-consecutive, so we're good to go there. Now, I've skipped a couple, but let's move on to 10. So let's notice that 10 is F5 plus F2. F5 is eight, that's the fifth Fibonacci number in our ordering here, and F2 is two, so eight plus two is 10. And then 11 will be eight plus three, so that's F5 plus F3. Great, still non-consecutive. Now notice 12 is one more, but we're allowed to add F1 here because they'll be non-consecutive. So we've got F5 plus F3. 
3 plus F1. Now you guys could fill out more values of this if you wanted to, but I think that's a big enough illustration to see how this seems to be possible. So now let's jump into the proof. So now that we've looked at some examples, let's go ahead and prove this result. So notice there is an existence statement to prove as well as a uniqueness statement. We'll do these separately. So we'll prove the existence statement first, which says that every natural number can be expressed as a sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Then later we'll show that that expression is unique. So we'll do this existence proof by what's called strong induction. We don't need a base case here. Well, we do need a base case because it's an inductive proof, but we did a bunch of base cases on the chart in the previous board, so we won't reconstruct those. So now let's make our strong induction hypothesis, which says this. So suppose for all M, which are between one and K, including one, but not including K, we have an expression of M as a sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So I'll maybe just call those as FRs for Fibonacci numbers. And now we wanna consider the number K. And so this actually splits up into two cases, one of which is very, very quick. So if, k is a Fibonacci number itself. So in other words, if the number k is equal to fr for some r natural number, we are done. There's nothing else to do. It's already expressed as the sum of one Fibonacci number. So let's maybe move on to the second case, which is if k is not Fibonacci, so it's not a single Fibonacci number. But if it's not a single Fibonacci number, then it lies in between two consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So that means there exists some j where f sub j is strictly less than k, which is strictly less than f sub j plus one. So those are the two Fibonacci numbers for which k lies between. So next up, we'll apply our induction hypothesis to a certain number which is less than k. Well, we can only apply our induction hypothesis to something less than k because we've assumed it for things less than k. And which number less than k? Well, it will be k minus fj. So 2k minus f sub j. So what does that mean? That means we can write k minus fj as a sum of non-consecutive distinct Fibonacci numbers. So in other words, it can be written as fm1 plus fm2 plus all the way up to fmr, where these are distinct and non-consecutive. We can actually rewrite that in terms of an inequality as mi plus one is bigger than or equal to mi plus two. So being strictly bigger than mi means that they are distinct and being strictly bigger than mi plus one means that they are non-consecutive. But now let's take this number k minus fj and do something with this inequality right here. And we'll do something with that inequality by subtracting fj from all parts. So let's note that k minus fj is less than fj plus 1 minus fj, but fj plus 1 minus fj is exactly equal to fj minus 1, just by rewriting this recursion a little bit up here. But why is that important? Well, if k minus fj is less than fj minus 1, so that means that none of these Fibonacci numbers here are equal to this fj minus one. So that means that fm maybe sub k is not equal to fj minus one for all mk. But 
In particular, we'll use that the largest one of these is not equal to fj minus one. Notice by the ordering that we have right here, the largest one is fmr. So we have fmr is not equal to fj minus one. Okay, so like I said, these are going from smallest to largest. The largest is not equal to fj minus one. So that means if we add fj to both sides, well, that means that we will not have consecutive Fibonacci numbers, but that's exactly what we want. So let's see, we have K is equal to FM1 plus all the way up to FMR plus FJ. And by our construction right here, these are non-consecutive. So these are okay. So what that means is that we do have an expression. We have an expression for K as a sum of distinct and non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers, proving this existence statement. Okay, so now we'll prove the uniqueness part. Now that we've finished proving the existence of such a decomposition, we're ready to prove the uniqueness. So let's see how to do that. So let's suppose that we've got two expressions which are sums of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So I'll call those maybe expressions A, which is FM1 plus all the way up to FMR, and B, which is FN1 all the way up to FNS. And we'll use a similar trick to what we did for the existence proof to encode in here that these are distinct and non-consecutive. And that is, we'll take mi plus one to be bigger than or equal to mi plus two, and ni plus one to be bigger than or equal to ni plus two. So that means these are small, starting from the smallest ones to the largest ones. Now I'd also like to point out that without loss of generality, we can assume that none of the Fibonacci numbers in this sum are equal to any of the Fibonacci numbers in this sum. And that's because, well, if they were equal, we could just like subtract them from both of these terms one at a time until they are all distinct. So like I said, without, general, without loss of generality, FMI is not equal to FNJ for all appropriate N and J. So in other words, this list right here is totally separate from this list right here. Okay, another thing that we can assume without loss of generality is that one of these ends at a bigger Fibonacci number than the other. You might say, well, what if they ended at the same Fibonacci number, but they can't by this assumption right here. So let's also assume that this FMR is less than FNS. Okay, but we wanna push that strict inequality to a non-strict inequality and observe that this implies that FMR plus one is less than or equal to FNS. So that's the Fibonacci number after FMR. Okay, good. So now this is our setup which we'll use to finish this whole thing off. Okay, so now let's look at our number A. So let's just rewrite that. A is equal to FM1 plus all the way up to FMR. But let's notice that this is less than or equal to the following expressions, which we need to do in a piecewise manner, which we'll see why. This is less than or equal to F1 plus F3 plus FMR. And this is the case when MR is odd, right? So we're allowed to add every other Fibonacci number. And so we can exchange this distinct non-consecutive sum with sort of the largest distinct and non-consecutive sum that includes these terms here. And that would be something like this. 
or if MR is even, it'll look like F2 plus F3 ending at FMR. So that's gonna be if MR is even. But there are nice Fibonacci identities for the sum of all the odd Fibonacci numbers and the even Fibonacci numbers. And these are gonna look slightly different than they might look in a standard setup because we've got this kind of shifted Fibonacci numbers here. And in fact, both of these are equal to FMR plus one minus one. So we have FMR plus one minus one where one of those plus ones is happening within the in index and the other one and the minus one is happening outside of the index. So putting this all together, we have A is less than or equal to FMR plus one minus one, which means it's strictly less than FMR plus one if we just leave off the minus one, but that's less than or equal to FNS by this inequality right here, but then FNS will be less than or equal to the sum of all of these FNs. So FN1, FN2, plus all the way up to FNS, but that's equal to B. So in the end, we have A is strictly less than B. In other words, A is not equal to B. So what we did is we took two sums of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers, and we showed that they were not possibly equal, which is exactly what we need for this uniqueness. And that's a good place to stop.